Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket, by the fans, for the fans. Yes, yes, yes. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another edition, another episode of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. My name is Marshall St. Patrick Hewitt, one half of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. And with me as ever is my partner in crime, Santoki Nagilendran. Santoki, how you doing? Yeah, all good, Mash. Hope you're good. And we're back again, you know, as the world's eyes fixes on the World Cup, you know, played in India, massive stadiums, um, not so full stadiums, but... um. Generally, everyone in the cricketing world focused on this one tournament. We're here in our little corner, getting ready for the Super 50, following, you know, the, the inter-county 50 over cricket in Guyana, the Windward Islands tournament. We're here, you know, building up to West Indies, um, coming back to playing ODIs in December against England and the Super 50, obviously, playing a big part in the formation of that tournament. But, Mash, this episode... <laughs> It's a bit of a deep dive. We're going live as well. We're here to address the big question of why exactly aren't West Indies at the ODI World Cup? And a lot of people will say, hold on, that's a two-minute answer. We didn't beat Netherlands and Scotland in the World Cup qualifiers. But obviously, we're here to look at this episode to talk about how it was more of a long-term issue that was sort of building towards the climax, which did climax in us losing in the qualifiers in Zimbabwe. So, Mash, do you want to take it away and set the context for this episode? Yeah, for sure, for sure. And ultimately, like you say, for everybody who's tuning in with us, whether it's live on YouTube, whether it's live on Twitter, we're doing this on a kind of dual uh, a dual kind of hosting sites today. Um, yeah, we wanted to break it down because Santoki, over the last, what, pretty much since the World Cup hype built, so over the last two and a half weeks, three weeks, there's been the obvious article that every journalist, not every journalist, but you know what I mean, has wanted to write oh, this World Cup isn't the same because the West Indies aren't here. How could it get to this? Why has this situation got to the way it's got to? But the joke is, Santoki, no actual Caribbean journalist or West Indian has actually written about it, really and truly. <laughs> so we, we got, we've got everybody around the world who follows cricket having an opinion on it, except people in the Caribbean itself. And uh, as I kind of said to you when we were going back and forth on WhatsApp, um, we were saying, let's actually just do it. Let, let's be the one to deep dive on it and actually try and give the context and the, the real kind of analysis and explanation as to why the West Indies aren't there. And like you say, the first thing to debunk, the easy answer, the obvious answer that everyone will turn to is go, well, they were, they were shit in the World Cup qualifiers. <laughs> and yeah, they were, they were, but that's been coming from a long, long, long time ago. If lest everyone forget, we had said on multiple episodes of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, on multiple episodes of West Indies on 99.94, that we did not think the West Indies would qualify for the World Cup. So it came as no surprise to us. So what I would be saying to everyone who's writing your articles is, before you write them, come to the two people who were saying for over one year, West Indies are not going to make it. At, at, at the, we've, been t we've been trying to tell everyone. And people didn't want to listen to why we were telling everyone this was going to happen. So what I've written down, Santoki, mm. is, is several reasons, several reasons why we've ended up where we're at. So the, the first place I kind of want to go, let's go recent. And what I want you to do is after I give you each reason, and obviously everyone who's live in the chat with us at the moment, big up yourselves. Thank you as ever for supporting the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, Road to 6K, all of that, all of that. Um, Santoki, here's the first one. Would we have made it to the World Cup qualifiers if the pandemic hadn't hit and we hadn't sent a C team to Bangladesh in 2021? Let's unpick that one first. That's, that's I mean, an interesting Cup, one, sorry, Mash. To the World Cup, sorry, Santoki, not to the World Cup qualifiers, sorry. Yeah, that's an interesting one because on the one hand, you'd say, obviously, sending that C team, did who opened? Was it Otley? Otley opened in that one. Like... <laughs> 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 hey, let's end the episode Otley, now. Man. That, that's Kjorn why we out, not even out of the wilderness. Just Kjorn Otley. How? What type of what? What type of selection do you have to go to before you get to Kjorn Otley to come and open for the West Indies? 
<laughs> you know what's mad? I would love to have been a fly on the wall for like the selection meeting for that and just like see the process as to how they suddenly just ended up with Otley opening in the middle of Bangladesh for ODI series. But Mash, I think that's a very good point. And for those of you wondering, me and Mash haven't plotted this out before the episode. This is just off the cuff, you know, we're just reacting. I'm reacting to Mash's questions live as they come. So I think the first one is, yeah, we would, we probably wouldn't have lost 3-0. I mean, it's Surely we'd get one win in Bangladesh, but ultimately I think we'd still lose the series in Bangladesh. Bangladesh are a very good ODI side, adapting mm. to those conditions. But I think it's also important to remember, Mash, remember at that point, that was like the first series in the ODI Super League, I think. Yeah. So at that point, I don't think anyone realised the repercussions of losing the series. No one had like, it, was, it, was, um, it wasn't it was taken as seriously. It was kind of dismissed as, oh, well, we lost 3-0, we've lost 30 points, but no one really knew what it meant. I think... If it had come later down the line in the pandemic, Cricket West Indies might have asked to reschedule it like we saw with numerous series. So I think just a lack of understanding made was the reason why we sent the C team. But to be honest, Mash, I think if there wasn't a pandemic, going back to your original question, I think there's so many different scenarios that would have occurred. And I don't think we would have won 3-0. I don't think our points cha- would have changed that much. Um, we might have got one win at best, I think. Um I still think even with even with a full schedule, no pandemic, I still don't think we would have qualified, uh, made it through the Super League and we would have had to go through uh, the qualifiers. Just to let people know, in fact, T Brown has just said what I was about to say. Jason Mohammed was the captain, fam, <laughs> in Bangladesh. This is the team for the final ODI in Bangladesh. Kion Otley, this is from 1 through to 11. Kion Otley, Sunil Ambris, Nkrumah Bonner, Carl Mayers, Jason Mohammed, captain. Robman Powell, Jamar Hamilton, Raymond Reefer, Alzari Joseph, Akil Hussain, Keon Hardin. Now, the joke is, Santoki, some people will hear that and go, well, w- wait a minute, Mayers, Powell, Joseph, Hussain, Reefer, five of the team are technically part of the West Indies team now. So you could argue, was it really a C team or does it just show the overall weakness of the West Indies that five of those players are established in our old GI side now and we still got hammered by Bangladesh away from home. Exactly. Yeah, no, exactly. So um I don't think the pandemic would have changed much. Um it might have given us a few extra points. Um but yeah I still think we would have had to go go through the qualifiers. But Mash, I'm gonna I'm gonna counter, you know, you hit me with a question, so I'm gonna counter this one is a more overarching question. Do you think that 2014 tour in India where Bravo um essentially led led the players to saying we're not going to continue this series against India because we haven't we haven't been given fair conditions as players do you think that moment not because of what Barvo done I think he was fully justified in what he done but do you think the way things spiraled and the repercussions it had going forward do you think that specific tour in 2014 was the nail in the coffin for West Indies ODI cricket in terms of that moment set us on course for not qualifying for a World Cup down the line 100%. And this is how you know, people, that Santoki and I haven't planned this beforehand because I've got it written down on my piece of paper. Oh, okay. and I, I didn't have, I didn't even know Santoki was going to mention it. I would argue, Santoki, so just, just for people who aren't keen students or don't really understand the full ramifications of the nitty gritty of West Indies cricket, in 2014, Dwayne Bravo was captain of the West Indies ODI side. At the time, Dwayne Bravo was ranked the number one all-rounder in ODI cricket. We went to India and we were 2-1 down in the series. There'd been a lot of kind of ramifications in the background. The players had effectively not even wanted to play the tour, as I understand it. The BCCI effectively had to beg the West Indies players uh, to, to, to try and play more of the matches. Dave Cameron refused to go out there and meet the players. He flew home, so on and so forth. At the time of that tour in India, Dwayne Bravo's win percentage was 46% as West Indies OGI captain. It was the best win percentage any West Indies OGI captain had had in the 21st century. To put this in perspective, we we were on our best run as an OGI cricket team. So much so that that series in which we were 2 1 down with against India, we were actually relatively competitive against the Indians in India. As those who do know, Bravo um, got blamed for it. Pollard got blamed for it. Um, who else got blamed for it? Uh, Bravo, Pollard. Bravo and Pollard were the two, were the main Sammy. two. Technically, yes, Sammy as well. Uh, you can throw Gail in there. A lot of them 
got blackballed out of West Indies cricket after that tour of India. We, in fact, Bravo never played an ODI again. Pollard played about three or four prior to becoming captain in 2019. Sammy never played again. Whether he should have done or whether he shouldn't have done, the point is he never played again. Gail went to the World Cup in 2015 and basically never played again until the World Cup qualifiers in 2018. So the, 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 the argument I make about that whole period, um, Satoki, is that we asset stripped for our own dunceness as a Cricket West Indies organisation. We asset stripped our own team of the number one all-rounder in the world, of Kyron Pollard in his prime, of Chris Gale in his prime, Darren Sammy, we won't count. But the point is, we asset stripped our own team and weakened it. And lest, I, lest we continue from that point, Santoki, surely it's no coincidence that after that all happened, between 2015, the end of that um, OJ World Cup, when we lost in the quarterfinals, to, 20, to 2019, the start of the next World Cup, we won no series anywhere in the world. So I would argue that this ODI decline was self-inflicted. Yeah, definitely. I think you've hit the nail on the head. Um, spot on analysis. As you said, DJ Bravo never played again from that 2014 series. Darren Sammy, I think he ca he came into the World Cup as an injury replacement. And that's sort of a credit to sort of Daniel Darren Sammy's loyalty to West Indies, the fact he came back. But even then, it was almost an uneasy alliance. So it was the fact it was a World Cup. They played Gale. They played Sammy. Sammy never played an ODI after that 2015 World Cup. And despite that, even with a fragmented team, oh, obviously... Narayan as well didn't play in that World Cup because of his action. And that's also been a massive, that's um, a separate issue. But Narayan's action has essentially denied West Indies white ball side of one of the all-time great spinners in the region. Um, but yeah, after that 2015 World Cup, essentially we got a foreshadow of it in that South Africa series where A.B. de Villiers annihilated the bowling. And sort of <laughs> the moment, that was a foreshadow of what to come. But essentially after that World Cup, we still made the quarterfinals, remember? even with this yep. fragmented team, just because of the quality that sort of still committed to play to West Indies. After that, once you've had Sammy go, um, Gail go, Pollard played, like you said, sporadically, I think three ODIs, we essentially saw Mash, the great rebuild. So Jason Holder, 23 years old, given the captaincy, and he was essentially tasked as rebuilding the next generation of West Indies ODI players um, leading into that 2019 World Cup. However, the problem is, Mash, the asset stripping continued. Marlon Samuels didn't play an ODI, I think, after 2016. Dennis Rand didn't play an ODI after 2016. Both of them came out in the media completely baffled as to why they'd been dropped from the ODI side. Darren Bravo put out a tweet against David Cameron. He was gone from the ODI side. So, <laughs> Jason Holder, for 2015 to 2019, when we didn't win, we'd asset strip the whole side of any sort of experience. Holder was essentially meant to galvanise a young set of players into a white ball champion without any sort of experience in the locker room. And it led to a weird period mash where pretty much anyone in the region who could strike a ball was picked for the side. You had, they tried Craig Baffert as opener, Kieran Powell, Chandra Paul Hemraj, Carl Hope. Everyone got a shot. There was no philosophy mash. And that 2015 to 2019 reason essentially forms the foundation of why we ended up, or why we slowly gravitated into an abysmal associate level ODI side. Yeah, and do you know what we have to also throw in there about that period of time, 2015 to 2019? There was no philosophy. There was, there was, there was like, so you when, you when you end up in a situation in 2023 where, where Scotland are beating you easily and Zimbabwe are turning you over easily and the Netherlands are chasing down 374 and then smashing you for 30 plus in a, in a what do you call it, super over, that all stems from. That's that's a complete structural issue. People were just, and this goes to my next point, actually. People were just coming in and out of the team, but there was no clear philosophy as to what type of OJ cricket West Indies were even playing. And it links to my next point, Santoki, because unlike every other team in the world, West Indies suffers from one thing, I would say, more than... OK, maybe you want to throw in the Netherlands, actually, because they, they could say all their players play in... Uh, English, um, the county game and so on and so forth. But one of the big problems West Indies have is you never know as a West Indian, um, as a West Indian supporter, sorry, who is in what squad from series to series. We, we, I couldn't tell you the last time we had a settled good squad. Someone's always out. 
Someone's always out for personal reasons. They need rest. They need this. They're banned from the team. It's a disciplinary issue. So I couldn't actually tell you, Santoki, the last time we had a settled good team. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. I couldn't, for that period, 2015 to 19, I couldn't tell you what the philosophy was other than bat as badly as possible and take as much licks as you can. Um, there was no, There was no strategy, no ideology. Players were discarded after three, four games. New players were brought in. It was sort of a mess of a period, Mash. And it's telling as well that rather than stick with these group of players, essentially before the 2019 World Cup, there was panic and the likes of Gale was were called back in. Nicholas Poran was brought into the side after calls for the past few years to have him into that ODI side. He was finally brought in ahead of the World Cup. So again, Mash, it's sort of, from the administrators and selectors, there was just a lack of faith. Just because when it did come down to a clutch moment at a World Cup, when West Indies were on the global stage, Oh, sorry, going before that, World Cup qualifiers the year before, Mm. there was panic, essentially, and realised, hold on, this new ideology of Jason Holder leading the young guns to the World Cup is not going to work. We have to call back the guys who we discarded. So, again, just no coherent strategy from administrators, selectors, and it just led to, like you said, Mash, no clear philosophy at all. And I'd argue, even to this day, there's no clear philosophy in the ODI side. Yeah, I'm just looking back at that, that 2018 um, World Cup team. We called Chris Chris Gell and Marlon Samuels mm. came out of the wilderness <laughs> to come play in <laughs> to come play in that world. But they hadn't even been playing for the West Indies. And if I remember rightly, they actually reached out to Pollard and yeah. I think to DJ Bravo to try and get them. But they'd already made commitments elsewhere. So the, the as you say, Santoki, the fact that at the last World Cup qualifiers we had to turn to and beg people who we had essentially discarded to come and get us over the line means that we hadn't actually developed anyone. We, we, hadn't, we, hadn't, we hadn't developed anyone coming into the 2019 World Cup, which, which again is a nice segue, Santoki, because you fast forward four years, right? I did some, I did some stat crunching. Shea Hope is the obvious exception, right? Shea Hope averages 50. Strike rate talk notwithstanding, there's an argument to say Shea Hope gets into every other squad in the world just based on that average alone, irrespective of strike rate. I said to myself, other than, I said, who else in the West Indies? I, I went through the whole region, Santoki. These are the top averages in OJ. <laughs> These are the top averages in OJ cricket across the whole region. Hope, 50. Nicholas Puran, 40 from 61 games. The next highest after that is Casey Cart. Sorry, oh, sorry, it's actually Evan Lewis, but Evan Lewis goes into the previous point of, well, he's never available. The next highest after that is Casey Carty. Averages 34 from 16 games. Shimron Hetmeyer, the great Shimron Hetmeyer, averages 33 from 50 games. Brandon King, 31 from 34 games. Jamar Brooks, 30 from 29 games. Darren Bravo, 30 from 122 games. When we did that video after the World Cup qualifiers, when we got eliminated, Santoki, there, there was a meme that came out of it after that video where I said, all of our players are shit. And I think I got a couple people messaged me and said I was out of order for saying that and that I'm not a true supporter of the West Indies. But taking those stats I just gave you, Santelki, how can you have a good ODI team when only two players have any kind of statistical evidence that suggests they belong on the international level, international scene? Two batters, you know, in the whole region of the Caribbean, we have two bat- batters capable of putting together an ODI innings. And also, Mash, the other concerning thing is of that list, I don't know how many names you put, maybe eight to ten, it seemed about three quarters of those players are no longer available for West Indies ODI side. I would argue Poran has essentially gone on hiatus from ODI cricket. Um, who else was on this? Shamar Brooks. Oh, Evan Lewis hasn't played an ODI since 2021. Shimmer and Hetmeyer. You know, we don't we know the story of Hetmeyer in and out the side. Shamar Brooks just turned 35 a few weeks ago. He's never come back to the ODI side. Darren Bravo again. Approaching 35, hasn't played ODIs in a while. You doubt he's going to be there. So that's already five on that list, Mash, who aren't going to be in <laughs> ODI. So essentially, you're looking at, from your list, you're looking at Shy Hope, 
and then a long way down, Casey Carty and Brandon King as the as the as the well, future of West Indies ODI cricket. That's it. That's it. Three players. We've got three batters in the whole region, averaging about thirty, bro. <laughs> Thing is, is that anyone thinking that I'm laughing because it's funny? I'm not laughing because it's funny. It's tragic. So if, if people want to kind of pinpoint how have West Indies got themselves in this situation, look at the poor level of, of, of battership. Look at the poor level of it. You cannot you cannot expect an international team to compete. I don't even want to say regularly. I just want to say to compete when you only when you can only find three batters who you know are fixtures in the team going forward with the merest of av- one with a world class average and two just over 30. The, the just over is, it, you know. The thing is, I would love to know because obviously we're playing England, our first ODI series after the World Cup. Usually with an England tour, there's a lot of media scrutiny on the side. I would love to know sort of what the analysis is going to be from English journalists about this West Indies ODI side because as it stands, it doesn't look like Poran or Holder are going to be taking part. Who knows if we'll ever see Holder play ODIs again. Poran, like I said, is hiatus. My gut feeling is he's almost doing like what Ben Stokes did. Um, just sort of taking a break from the format and maybe nearer towards the Champions Trophy. I don't think we're going to. I don't think we can qualify for that. No, we won't, we won't be in. We won't yeah, be in that. Be in. So maybe just 2026, we might see Poran again play ODI cricket in the build-up for the World Cup. So we've already lost two key players there. And if you look at the if you look at the Super 50 or the build-up to the Super 50, Brandon Corlett, um done a great statistical breakdown of the Guyana 50, Super 50 that's taken place uh, in the past week. Only in one instance, I think there was 14 innings from teams. In one instance, did a team score more than 205 runs. And that's the best of the best in Guyana. And that that cohort of players are going to represent Guyana at Super 50. And Super 50 is where you sort of make up the West Indies team going forward. So there is a massive issue match with batting, putting together runs. And we haven't even touched on the bowling yet in the region. The bowling, yeah, don't, the don't worry. I'm about, to, I'm about to get to the bowling. I'm just talking about batters at the moment. But do you know what? I, and, uh, I'm going to link the batting point to another factor in why we're in the situation we're in. In At the start of, was it 2021 or was it 2022? We played Ireland in that OGI series and lost at home, which again was another foreshadow of what was to come, right? We lost 2-1 at home against Ireland in an OGI series. I'll always remember this, Antoki. The then captain, Kyron Pollard, came out and said after that series, we have a serious endemic problem with batting in the region, right? And the joke was, rather than everyone listen to him and go, mm, that's a good point, you know, what are we going to do? Everyone cussed him out. <laughs> everyone cussed him out and said, what type of captain is that? He's throwing everybody under the bus <laughs> saying that they can't bat and so on and so forth. And you had people like me and you go in, yeah, Pollard's making a very good point here. There is a proper batting issue in the region. Nobody chose to listen to him. And here we are, since he stepped down from the captaincy in April 2022, here we are now, a year and a half later, and we're not at a World Cup. So I don't know, where do you, in, looking back at that kind of, in the, the context of, of the point he was trying to make after the Ireland series, do you think, Santoki, that even now, do you think people have taken that on board? No, I think I think it's an open secret that there are batting issues, but I'm not seeing anything being done to address that balance, either at a territorial level or on a wider level. Um, so I think the batting issues are going to continue. I don't think um, Shai Hope's the type of captain who will be as honest and transparent. I don't think it's his character to say the batting's terrible. So I don't think it will ever become in the public realm again, like a major issue. I think people have just accepted it for what it is. But we're at MASH at the moment, our ODI side... If you're watching it, you you wonder how they're going to get past 200 at points just because the batting quality is not there. And I think the problem for us now is going forward is, at least in that period, 2015 to 19, we could console ourselves with the fact that there were alternatives. So we could always say like, oh, well, we're, you know, if Chris Gale gets picked or if Pollard gets picked, we can change it around. Now, we're essentially picking the best players in the region. Um, and it's threadbare. There's no depth. There's no one else to come in. If you look at now, if we're talking about a great rebuild, Mash, is there anyone on the sidelines who you think, oh, we, if we bring them in, we might be able to change our fortunes? We've tried and tested everyone in the region, and this is the level where we're at. Listen, we, we, West Indies are in a situation right now where unless they go for, like, the eye test of seeing a player play a couple innings and say, you know what, 
Now we just need to invest in that player. They're probably going to fail a whole bunch of times, but we've seen something in them that suggests we should give them a long run. Basically, the perfect example of that is Casey Carty. It's taken till now for us to not qualify for a World Cup, for people to finally accept maybe Casey Carty should just get a long run in the side because there's something about him which suggests he's got the temperament. Maybe we should just give him a long goal. It should already have happened, by the way, right? But here's why I've got issues I'm talking. Look at the first two regional squads that have been announced for Super 50, right? And this, this is another fa- yet another factor, people, in why West Indies are where they're at because there is no joined-up thinking at the territorial level to the wider West Indies level. So if I take the Barbados squad, for example, I saw that squad, Santoki, and I say this with ultimate respect to Craig Brathwaite. Why is Craig Brathwaite in the squad, Santoki? Yeah. What, what, what feasible benefit is that bringing to wider West Indies, to wider West Indies cricket to put Craig Brathwaite to, to open for Barbados? What I don't understand, right? Are you, are you saying that Brathwaite is suddenly going to get a call up to the West Indies team? And this is before Santoki I mentioned the fact that they've called... And obviously, these are international players, right? So Brooks is in there, Chase is in there, Reef is in there, Mayers is in there, Brathwaite is in there, Hope is in there. Uh, I've probably missed... I've probably left someone out, right? And I'm interested, I'm interested to see what you're going to say to this, Santoki. They're obviously international players. So where is the balance between... They're probably the best batters in, in Barbados. But... Are they going to change the wider fortunes for West Indies cricket? Should there not be some kind of thinking which says, why don't you drop out so we can give this youngster a goal to help his future development because he may have a shot at West Indies? Where do you stand on that? Yeah, I think completely. I think the Super 50 is meant to be a feeder system to West Indies cricket. It's ultimately served the best interest of West Indies cricket. Craig Bathway, at his stage in his career, we know what a great Red Bull player is. He's never going to be playing white ball cricket for West Indies. So to have him as captain of the Barbados side is illogical. But however, if you're looking at it from the other perspective, in Barbados, the selectors and the coaches will be under pressure to get results because of that patriotic angle, the fact that you need to win a title or perform well. So it's trying to balance those results, winning results in Super 50, balanced against serving West Indies great good. But as you said, Mash, at the moment, it's very, very lopsided um, towards picking players who you think are going to help you win Super 50, but aren't going to contribute anything to West Indies cricket because of their age and the stage they're at in their careers. We've already seen with um, Trinidad and Tobago, they've hint, suggested they'll pick Sunil Narayan. Again, Sunil Narayan's a player who will probably take you to the final, at least, um, in Super 50, but he's never going to play ODI cricket. He hasn't played in seven years for West Indies. So how is that benefiting West Indies cricket, Mash? And... So I don't think I don't think we'll ever unless there's a massive overhaul of the system and it's almost like a CPL thing where you do a massive draft and you mix up all the players and franchises just territorial franchises just have to pick have to have a mandate to pick younger players and you know this kind of thing unless there's a dramatic overhaul it will always be the same because essentially you could argue um you know territorial franchises care more about a Guyana or Trinidad winning than they do about the contribution to West Indies cricket, which again goes against the whole purpose of leads to the wider question of what is West Indies cricket and what does it mean to franchises and players. So at the moment, Mash, I just think it's it's essentially every territory for themselves. They're picking the best players they can, regardless of age or experience, to try and help them get that Super 50 title. I, I, I should just point out as well, I'm not picking on Barbados people, because when I saw Jamaica's squad, and remember, I'm a Jamaican, you know, when I saw Jamaica's squad, Santoki. And again, I say this with respect. Chadwick Walton is in the Jamaica squad. Chadwick mm. Walton's 38 years old. What on earth is... what? On, Jordan Johnson just went and played for West Indies under 19 and scored three centuries in Sri Lanka. So you mean to tell me that it's better to pick Chadwick Walton at 38 years old? Um, obviously, they play different positions. Walton's a wicketkeeper. But you mean to tell me that Walton is getting a pick... Um, Dennis Bulai, who's 36, is getting a pick. Bonner's getting a pick at 35. And I've got nothing against any of these players. But what does that say to Jordan Johnson then? Was a, 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 territorial cricket don't make no sense. It don't make no sense. The thing is, though, like, also, I mean, Cricket West Indies could argue and say, you know, we've got the academy and the combined colleges and campuses. But, Mash, I still don't understand what the purpose of combined campuses and colleges is. Like, what? Last year, there was sort of a weird mishmash of players. 
with Dennis Randon as captain. This year, Shane Dowich is the captain. But there also needs to be clarity on sort of what is the purpose of them? Are they like, what is there a mandate for an age bracket they're for? Are they players you're hopeful can make it into like into stars in the future? So I think there's confusion over that. And also the West Indies Academy, again, a lot of inexperience. We saw them do well last year um, in the four day cricket. But you can't have a team full of 11 youngsters. You have to mix it up a bit so they get used to playing with seniors and that sort of step up in level. Did you did you see the um did you see how they're picking the, the CCC squad this year? No. Darren Ganga put out a, a picture and it oh, said you, it. have you not seen it? <laughs> <laughs> After this, I'm gonna send you I'm gonna send it to you in the WhatsApp. It's a picture of Darren Ganga, and it says, if you're interested in playing for CCC, email me. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, that in what? a nutshell sums up the state of West Indies cricket. What? What, is what? what is that? What's that, fam? Like, what's the email? I might have to send him an email, you know? <laughs> man, said, man said, are you interested in playing for CCC? Drop me an email. Like, is that... Is that how you play territorial cricket in West Indies? I can't believe that. I need to see this picture. But that is wild in, in and of itself. But, wait, till um, I send, wait till I send you the picture after this, after this chat. Also, guys, also, um, if you're watching this, Amash, I don't know how many are tuned in, but remember to like, comment, subscribe, share the motive. And Mash, also, those of you on our YouTube channel would have noticed we, we've upgraded with the thumbnails. Yeah, for real, for real. So... Uh, I need to pick up uh, Devon Baz uh, Bazdio, and I should have asked you, Devon, before I said your name, if I'm saying it right phonetically. But big up, um, big up, Devon. Um, Devon reached out to us um, uh, through Instagram, I think, and just said, "Listen, um, you lot could really up your game in terms of how you do your graphics and thumbnails and things like that." So big up, Devon. He's the one who's been doing all our new thumbnails and like the kind of consistent style uh, that you're seeing on all of the YouTube content. So go follow him at Devon Bastio, so that's um, D-E-V-A-N-B-A-S-D-E-O. Big up, Devon. Um, so, yes, yeah, Santoki, like, like I say, that I, I had a one, I had a few more points to go for, and actually there was a super chat I should just bring up on the screen. Um, so, Rishab Sharma, thank you, Rishab, I hadn't forgotten you, says, um, your expectation from West Indies in the T20 World Cup next year as a host. We haven't really got into that yet, Santoki. I'm not actually sure how the competition works in terms of group stages and all of that. Um, all I'll say, Santoki, is I think we'll do better than we did in the 2022 World Cup, but that don't mean much. Yeah, I think we'll do better because of the familiarity of grounds and the home crowd as well, pushing players. Um, I think if we can make it to the semi-finals, that will be seen, not by the fans, but I think realistically that will be a success if we can make it to the semi-finals. semifinals? Yeah. What? Wait, man, man said semi-finals. Semi-finals. <laughs> you think we're going anything to make semi-finals? Less, I think, I think anything, if you're looking at cricket, if you're the host and you're a full member nation and you're not making at least the semi-finals of your own tournament, it will be seen as a failure, basically. Fam, I'm, I, I just want us to win, like, two games or something. <laughs> <laughs> I just want two games. That's progress for me. <laughs> um, but listen, uh, Santoki, the final point that I've got um, is uh, the final point that I've got about why we are where we're at. And actually, do you know what? Basil was on here. He had a comment. Uh, we may have gone way past the comment now. Uh, that's Basil. For those who are, who are wondering who I'm talking about, that's Basil Butcher, uh, who was on our Guyana, Guyana history episode. Oh, here he is. So Basil said, good show, Mashes and Tokis. Basil, I watched into counting Guyana, and it was a joke. <laughs> uh, but, 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 um, but when I saw Basil's comment, I also, it may also reminded me of something, and I don't know if Basil's still watching the show. But Basil told me something um, about uh, when Phil Simmons was coach in 2016. And Basil, if you're still on and I've got it wrong, please get in the comments and just clarify for it. Clarify for me. Basil told me, Santoki, that when Simmons was coached in 2016, he put forward um, a suggestion to the West Indies Cricket Board that going forward, because remember, Hold, as, as you'd already alluded to, Holder had taken the team over. It was really young, really inexperienced. And Simmons suggested we use the experienced players to help Holder build a new ODI side and gradually, and that West Indies should focus on ODI cricket going forward because essentially Test was our weakest format 
T20, we already had the goats. So he said, let's focus on building the ODI side and put our experienced players in with Holder so that we can build towards the 2019 World Cup. This is what Basil told me. And, uh, the, 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 the suggestion was turned down by um, the, the people that matter in, in terms of West Indies cricket, hence why we never saw any of those seniors over that period of time. So I thought I'd just drop that story in because I wasn't privy um, to, to that information. It was Basil who um, informed me of that. Uh, what do you make of that, Santo? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, it doesn't surprise me. But again, like we said, I think often in West Indies cricket, we see a lot of uh, common sense uh, ignored. And so I think just the lack of, like we alluded to, the lack of experienced players to sort of assist the next generation has been detrimental. There's, if you're a youngster in that West Indies academy, you're looking around and sort of the icons in the game aren't involved in West Indies cricket at the moment. Um, if you're, I'm talking about recent icons like a Chris Gale or a DJ Bravo. Um, they're, they're involved maybe at CPL level, but not on a West Indies level. And I think that lack of knowledge and experience of playing the modern game in particular is um, something that's massively missing because most nations benefit from having experienced players sort of pass it on down to the next generation. Listen, we said we said before we started recording that we'd go half an hour. We've gone over by six minutes. So this is the final point I just want to make. I've crunched some more stats. Since the end of the World Cup in 2015, so on the 21st of March 2015, as you say, Santoki, we still made it to the quarterfinals. We got absolutely destroyed by New Zealand on that day. Martin Guptill hit like... 200 and summing off 160 yeah. balls. We lost by 143 runs, right? So we got we got smashed, but the point is we made it to the quarters. Since that game, West Indies have played 136 ODI matches. That's since the 21st of March 2015, people. We have won 45 in that time. That is a win percentage of 33%. I said, OK, that's terrible, but let me break this down even more. When Jason Holder got the captaincy in 2015 and we dashed away all those senior cricketers, we played 76 matches. We won 21. That is a win percentage of 28% in four years of OGI cricket. Pollard then took over and between 2019 and 2022, Pollard's win percentage was 40%. So we improved by 12%, but Pollard got cussed out of town and eventually quit because he couldn't take all the cussing that was coming his way. I guess my point is this, Santoki, those stats as a whole are dreadful, right? Particularly dreadful under Holder's captaincy, but we've, we've kind of given the caveats as to why he may have sucked in that time. I guess the point I'm trying to make to you is, and I didn't even I didn't even talk about Puran. Puran's win percentage must be in the 20s as well because he had a horrid time as captain. Yeah. Shea Holt, no better because we didn't even qualify for the World Cup. Does the captain matter? And I'm, I'm sure you're going to say no, but if the captain doesn't matter, how comes Pollard was able to get a 12% improvement on what Holder had done for four years? So does the captaincy matter or does it not? I think it does matter to, um, in the sense of even if you've got a poor squad, you can make improvements tactically and also motivationally. I think we saw from Pollard the high expectations he had for players, particularly in the field, raised the level slightly. Obviously, he didn't transform the team, but he did raise that win percentage. So I think a captain having a strong leader, just having that persona, Pollard's always had the persona of a leader. Um, I think Poran, as Fazir Mohammed alluded to on our episode about Trinidad, Poran's a great player, you can't deny it, but he doesn't necessarily exude the sort of same leadership qualities. So I think captaincy does matter, it can improve results, but in the case of West Indies where we're so far behind the rest of the nations in the world, even an improvement, a slight improvement, still means we're behind. It can't overall transform. So I think captaincy can help, but it's not the solution to sort of dramatically improving results. We never even got into the bowling and we're not going to because <laughs> I'm aware of, the, aware, yeah, aware of the time. But I guess let's try and conclude it then, Santoki, because we have to have a conclusion. Now, obviously, everyone's talking about old Jai cricket's likely to die and so on and so forth. And I probably agree with that. But I still think we'll have another World Cup before that moment happens. Right. So we're going to have that 2027 World Cup. I think it takes place in South Africa. Um we should get there because it's an expanded World Cup. But if 
you could wave a magic wand, what would you want to see happen over the next four years that is a realistic way to see West Indies improve in Old cricket? <laughs> oh, my God. That's a, that's a big question, Mash. I think... Firstly, I'd like to see a philosophy. So, what is the style of play? How, what are we, what type, what type of team are we trying to build, and where are we going from there? And secondly, I mean, these are there's loads of smaller points, but the two big ones are define a philosophy, have a set group of players that you're gonna go with for the next four years, but also I'd like to see Super Fifty incorporate more young players and players who aren't. The thing with Super Fifty is we're looking through the lists. It's all household names because it's all players who've been playing regional sometimes for 20 years, like in the case of Chadwick Walton. I'd like to see a Super 50 where you're looking at names and thinking, oh, okay, hold on, this is interesting. We don't know who these players are. And then see what talent we have in the region going like under 25 years old. So I think the main two ones, because I'm aware this is a conclusion, main two ones, define the philosophy and overhaul the Super 50 system. I don't know how realistic either of those are, but without those two, we're not going to do well in the next World Cup pretty much. I'll just throw one other in. Um, if I was Cricket West Indies, and I know obviously there's financial stuff behind it, I would organise as many A-team tours as I possibly could in white ball cricket, particularly 50 over cricket, to just en to anybody. Anybody, actually. I was about to say as um, associate sides, but actually just to anybody. Because actually, Santoki, I don't see our players improving if we don't expose them to more cricket out outside of the region and I'll, to, to quote Basil Butcher one more time telling these players to learn on the job doesn't work I think we've seen over the last 10 to 15 to how many years that only the most exceptional players like a Shea Hope will learn on the job so to speak um, in a format of cricket our players can't learn on the job. So the only way they're going to learn is if we get them out of the Caribbean, away from our dead up pitches, and to go get some experience mm -hmm. elsewhere, trying to formulate innings. As kind of like when the, the A team went to Bangladesh to go play that's the, 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 the kind of unofficial tests and whatever they played against Bangladesh. More of that needs to happen because I don't see how else the, these players are going to improve. Yeah, and well, also thinking outside progress. thinking outside the box, this has just come to my head. Like something like in England, the Royal London one day couple, whatever it's called, the 50 over. We've seen because of the hundred and internationals, essentially all the counties play their C team in this tournament for the past two, three years. Cricket West Indies obviously have a good relationship with the ECB because of you know traveling in a pandemic in recent times and, and that sort of relationship. Why not send a few West Indian players to play in the Royal London One Day Cup? I'm sure the counties wouldn't it's not taking the spot of an experienced player. They, they've got young players, essentially, reserve players in that side. So something like that, thinking outside the box as a means of getting West Indian players some exposure, different conditions and different setup. Because like you said, Mash, without that, if we're self-contained within developing within the Caribbean region, it's just not going to happen with the facilities and resources we currently have. Listen, people, we could go on and on and on. I'll just leave you with this caveat because Santoki and I don't have time to mention the bowling. But I did just just in case anyone says it in the comments, I'll quickly say it. Our best bowler is Alzari Joseph. He's played 63 ODI matches and he's taken his wickets at 28. That's our best bowler, fam. <laughs> <laughs> so we can't we can't score runs. We can't bowl no one out on a regular basis. <laughs> so so it, it is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, guys, um, over the next, over the course of the World Cup, you know, how long does it even last? It feels like it goes on forever, for the next two months or whatever. We'll probably be doing more of these regular, short episodes, just looking at different topics. Topics. So if you have any ideas or you want to see us discuss something, I've already seen a few comments about discussing ticket prices for West Indies Tour of England next year. Um, if you've got any ideas or comments you want us to discuss, drop them in the comments, hit us up on social media. We might cover it. But I think our next episode, Mash, during the week, will probably be a a review, a preview of the Super 50 and sort of what it means for West Indies cricket. So that's it for us now. Thank you, everyone, for joining and taking part in the comments as well. Hope you all have a good Sunday evening. And I'll pass the final word over to you, Mash. Yeah, you know how we do, people. Like up the video, share the video, subscribe. Um, anyone who doesn't know, get them to know about the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. No one does it like us on West Indies cricket. You know we're always going to keep it 100. Catch you soon on the other side. Enjoy your evening. 
Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket, by the fans, for the fans.